So hello, everyone, and welcome. I know you were expecting Matthew uh, part, gosh, like 72 at this point. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, Dave, Dave is, is, is taking a, a, a much needed rest, uh, so is Leah and Lyle, so uh, here it is, here I am, and uh, welcome to New Creation Church. Um, I am preaching on Jude today, <laughs> and... <laughs> uh, but I was actually going to go ahead and... Leviticus chapter 13... Verses 40 and 41, um, they're very important verses for understanding the rest of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, you don't necessarily have to turn there, I'll just go ahead and read it. Uh, but Leviticus 13:40 begins, now if a man loses the hair of his head, he is bald. He is clean. <laughs> if his head becomes bald at the front and sides, he is bald on the forehead, he is clean. So these are my life verses that I wanted to go ahead and open with here today. And you're like, why would you go ahead and start in the Old Testament on these very obscure pieces of scripture? Well, this specifically had to do with checking for leprosy. This is part of the old uh, Levitical uh, law. And it's important to understand context, specifically in the Old Testament. Uh, we're going to be spending a lot of time in, obviously, if we're talking about Jude, for those that have not yet read Jude, Jude references the Old Testament a ton. It's very, very important that we not be become New Testament only Christians because before the New Testament, they had what we now call the Old Testament. And old is not bad. Old is not antiquated. Old is not dead and therefore irrelevant. Uh, Jesus himself, obviously, even if we go to Jesus, where was Jesus citing from? Well, Jesus was citing from the Old Testament. He himself called himself the Word in the book of John, the embodiment of the Old Testament. And so as we go through Jude today, it's just another nice little reminder to, to read your Bible and to read it thoroughly. I know Dave comes up here and he has this very, very uh, seemingly daunting uh, command for all of us, right? Like re take a book of the Bible and read it 30 times and then you'll really, really know it. And I think that's good and that's important. I only actually made it to 23 times with Jude. Uh, <laughs> So this is for you, Dave. I tried. Uh, but if we're really going to understand things, um, yes, of course, we need to repeat. But one of the things that I find more and more frequently, I was talking with a pastor friend of mine at another church, and he, he is consistently surprised at the references that he will make to scripture and uh, people don't know the references that he's referencing because people don't actually take the time to, to read their Bible. There's a lot of emphasis, there's a lot of, of um, really attendance only Bible education that can happen within the church and it's good, right? Like obviously there needs to be some sort of selection process, people with the gift of teaching, people that are not heretics, right? To come up here and, and ex ex exposit and exegete the word, but that does not remove the burden upon all of us as believers to know the word of God. So I have another group of friends, their goal this last uh, nine, so, nine months or so now is they have a very aggressive reading plan to get through the entire Bible in a year. None of them have made it through the entire Bible yet. And I have, and so I just kind of poke fun at them while they read and study. Uh, <laughs> what, what was that? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but it is important. It is important to be familiar, right? Even, even if you can say you've read it once and you're like, oh, I know I've heard that somewhere before. Getting exposure to the word of God is absolutely vital for any walk of faith as we're going to find out here as we go through uh, the book of Jude. Uh, the book of Jude is, <laughs> the book of Jude is honestly a hard book. I love, I love, I talk with my wife and I'm like, you know, I should just do these like one chapter after Bible books anytime it's my time to preach. And so last week, last time I was preaching on Philemon, which has to do with a Christian slave owner. And I'm like, great, that's fun. <laughs> and this time we have uh, the letter of Jude, which is written, uh, many scholars believe, in the wake of 2 Peter chapter 2, which warns against false teachers will rise up among you. And now I realize that Dave is not here <laughs> and Lyle is not here. <laughs> And so here I am as a guest preacher talking about how false teachers are going to sneak in and provide <laughs> heretical teaching. And I'm like, I just know how to pick them. I, yeah, yeah. 
if, if, if when you watch this video online, there are any drastic cuts, <laughs> like, pay attention to those points. Uh, but, that, but that's exactly the thing that we have coming out here uh, in the book of Jude. Tangential to this, a uh, long, long time ago, I was a PC technician, which oh, I'm really glad I don't do that anymore, but I was hired back. Uh, I, I, I graduated, I left my student employment job, and I was hired back full-time during the great virus hoax era of the early millennium, right? The 2001, 02, 03 era, uh, because there were viruses going around um, computers, you know, hoaxes and worms and trojans. These may be words that are familiar <laughs> to some of you that were around back then. And uh, specifically, the bugbear virus was one of the big names at the time, which doesn't really mean anything now. But uh, there, was, there were also hoaxes. Hoaxes were things that pretended to masquerade as uh, serious threats, but they actually ended up causing great harm. And one of, or even not necessarily sometimes great harm, but sometimes just like what we would now refer to as a troll on the internet. They're kind of like tongue in cheek, jokey, look at what I made you do kind of things. And I was hired back to restore what was um, the, the awful and horrendous jdbgmgr.exe. Uh, thank you, thank you. My allergies flaring up. Uh, virus hoax. And what that was is a hoax that encouraged people to go ahead and follow all of these instructions and go right to this particular file location. And it was this odd name, and you didn't know what it was. And it was a picture of a bear. And don't forget that bug bear was a big virus. And so you definitely better delete that file because it's not good for you. Well, JDBG MGR is just Java Debug Manager. And Java is just a scripting language that you need in order to uh, understand code. It would help with websites. And so if you deleted this file, you would actually do harm to your Internet Explorer. <laughs> and the reason why it was a bear is because internally, Microsoft had teams based around animals. There was a rabbit team, there was a bear team, and so they chose a bear as an icon for this particular virus. And so my job was to go around all of campus and be like, OK, do you have the real virus? Yes or no? Most of them was no. Did you delete the, the fake one? OK, yeah. I got to go ahead and restore it. And so if you don't know these things, not to, again, not to terrify people, I don't want to start everyone off with additional fear mongering. There's plenty of that out in the world already. But knowing your Bible, understanding what actually exists, both in the Old and New Testament as we look at it, keeps you from these serious theological errors and hoaxes. So I hope the rest of the sermon is as good as the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> So if you're not in Jude already, go ahead and open it up. I'm just going to go ahead and read through it once and then pray, and we'll go ahead and dive in and talk about it. So Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of God, who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Yet in the same way, these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they have, not gone, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. 
These are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted. Wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These are grumblers, finding fault, following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, in the last time there will be mockers, following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire, and on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now, and forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Um, I am grateful, Lord God, that as as difficult and tricky as a text as this is, uh, with honestly all of its confusions and the things that may have been lost to us in terms of understanding, that there is still a revelation that you have given us here that all of your scripture has been breathed out out by you and is profitable for teaching and correction and reproof, including this letter. Again, confusing as it is. Uh, I just pray uh, to submit to you that your Holy Spirit would speak and teach through me the things that need to be said and the things that do not need to be said would be far from me. We love you. We are grateful for the power and presence of your Holy Spirit to testify to Jesus in all things. And we pray these things in his name, amen. So, beginning in verse one, Jude, a bond servant. We can stop a little bit there. Uh, I know that I've become a bit of, of, of a preacher when I start referencing sermons that I've already preached, even if there's only two of them to reference at this point. <laughs> but bond servant would have been something that had a literal meaning, meaning right? It, it, again, we, the, the difficult part, and I was again talking with a friend of mine about this the other day, like bond servant, slave, would have had a literal meaning at the time. So this is not, this is not allegorical. This is not metaphorical. It's not dramatic imagery for the purposes of saying, oh yeah, I'm sold out for Jesus Christ. Like servitude would have been a thing that existed in the time that this letter was written. And so it's important to recognize that Jude is not beginning his letter with hyperbole. Going on, of Jesus Christ, obviously, who are you indentured to, and brother of James. So here we have a letter that, in a lot of ways, very much is different from Paul and very much is different from John. He's like, this is a person that I imagine is like, I'm just kind of a dude. You know, my relationship to Jesus is not that I am an apostle. That would be in the forefront of the letter. It's not that even necessarily that I was with Jesus to begin with, but his affiliation to Christ is one, of a direct bondservant, but two, he's a brother of James. And so these are the credentials with which he's writing. Notice that there's not an alphabet soup of of fancy degrees and letters at the end of this particular introduction. Uh, I think we often place a lot of emphasis on education as a formalized, structured education as a way of denoting authority. But here we find that the only qualification that he has to write this particular letter is that he is a direct bondservant of Jesus and a brother of James. That's what he chose to start off his letter with. To those who are the called, as we've already heard, (laughs) there's a lot of stuff going on in this letter. And so it can probably be assumed 
that there are called in this letter. Not everyone in here is a, a false teacher or following false doctrine, uh, but there are individuals in this mass that I would imagine are called and they know specifically and concretely they are called. And he begins it with beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. For all the harsh things that we heard, for all the judgments, for all the Old Testament references, for all of the difficulties in weeding out falsehood within this body of believers, he wants them to know first and foremost that they have an identity as beloved in God the Father. For those of us that are beloved in God the Father, this, this pricks us a little bit, doesn't it? It means something to us. It's something that we can latch onto and hook, on, hook into. Even if we're currently walking in sin and we're walking away from things and maybe we're believing these things, if it's true, it kind of means something to us and, and it grabs our attention. And kept. This word kept comes up a lot later on, but um, this, this concept of kept has to do with a permanent residence. Like Dave, Dave is, I, I like quoting Dave because it's easy and I get brownie points with Dave for doing it. Um, not with God, just with Dave. So maybe I've chosen poorly with that. But like you're saved and there's nothing you can do about it. He begins this conversation about false teachers and false beliefs with you are kept. You are in the muck and the mire of people who are distorting the word of God and using it for selfish means. And yet, despite it all, you may even be believing some of these things yourself and yet you are kept. Like if, I, I, I would not start a letter off like this. I'd be like, you are wrong and you are wrong and you are wrong and that is, and that is evil and why don't you repent and all of these different things. That's why there's, that's why there's no additional you know, books in the New Testament named after me 2,000 years later, right? Like that's, I, I would not have started something like this, but you'll notice this pattern within the, the writers of the New Testament is that, is that they always ease into these things. Even Paul, who has nothing but like harsh reminders for the Corinthians, bothers to do exactly the same thing. Like, there's, there's things going on in the church at Corinth that ought not to be done. And he's like, I want to remind you again of who you are. And so if we don't start there and we just take a look at all the different things that are not going right, like I am prone to do, we miss a lot of the context of the letter. Sometimes when I'm reading, I find it very, very helpful to not open up a bunch of commentaries and not even necessarily have a notepad, but imagine that all I have is this particular letter. I don't have it with me, but that was exactly what I did when I was studying. I found it online. I, remo I stripped out all the verse numbers. You can do that because verse numbers are just inserted there by man. It's okay. Jude wouldn't have been like one, two, three. So you can go ahead and pull those out and then just read it end to end. And it's, if that was all I had, like what is this speaking to? And it forces me to sit sometimes perhaps uncomfortably with things that I might skip over, including this really tender, gentle, sincere introduction. He goes on to say, may, Percy, may, Percy, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. And that's not because he's gearing up to say you know, a hard message. I mean, this is a common way of encouraging the saints. We all need mercy. We all need peace. We all need to know the love of God in a personal and intimate manner, regardless of what it is that we're gonna be going through. He again repeats this concept of beloved in verse three. While I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, right, like hard left, <laughs> hard switch, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Uh, contend earnestly for the faith. Um, I have heard it said, and I disagree, I understand what they're trying to do, but I disagree with it. Like you don't need to come to God's defense, right? And I get what they're trying to say there with like, like you don't need to defend God. God is big enough and powerful enough to go ahead and you know, speak for himself. But we are also called to be his mouthpieces. We are called to be his hands and his feet. We are called to be sent. We are called to go out on mission. And we are called to carry the gospel message near and dear and true within ourselves. And so when I read this, contend earnestly for the faith, like the, before he even gets into all the false teacher stuff, I think we need to really pause and stop and think like, if we contend earnestly for the faith, will that truly dispel false teaching? I think the answer to that is yes. 
as you contend for the faith, as you contend for the true gospel, as you contend for what is actually true and written in scripture, yes, you may be unpopular, popular, yes, you may be even slightly annoying and people may not want to invite you to their birthdays anymore or, or something like that. Uh, maybe they, they, you know, maybe it could even be slightly worse, especially as society trends down the way that it is. But I, I find it very, very interesting to sit on contend earnestly for the faith. When you're in the middle of something and maybe as you look out around a crowd. Now, I'm not saying this congregation. Please don't, <laughs> please don't internalize. Again, think of the context in which this is being written. There are people who have snuck in. They've crept in. They have false doctrines. They're not following the true way of Christ. If you actually start to contend in this scenario for things that are true, what do you think is going to happen? And my hunch is, is that there's going to begin to be a divide from those who truly believe, for those who truly understand, for the things, these are gonna speak to the truths within people that are saved, and the falsehoods are ultimately gonna be exposed. They're gonna fall away, they're gonna come to light. And so, it's one of the reasons why I love that we're going through Romans on our Wednesday night thing, shameless plug, because we are contending for the truths in one of the most theologically rich book, the most theologically rich book, I think, probably next to Hebrews or John, in my opinion, maybe Revelation, throw a few out there, but uh, in the entire New Testament. And to sit and contemplate and go over Romans 7, which talks about the struggles of a believer, and to go through Romans 6, which talks about abusing the grace of God for his licentiousness. And to really chew on these things, not for the sake of being pundits, not for the sake of, again, impressing Dave or impressing me or, or just showing in your Bible flex on how super smart and strong you are, but we do these things to contend for the faith and to encourage one another in what is actually true. And you cannot do that if your Bible is not open. <sighs> Appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints, right? This, this gospel that we believe, real brief point, it's the same gospel that other people believed generations before us. There's wisdom and value in us as me, as a younger believer, to listen to people who have walked this walk of faith that are maybe generations ahead of me in terms of time. Likewise, of course, it does go the other way, but I find this rather disturbing trend within people in my generation and younger that they don't believe that they need the generation that came before them and it's unnerving, and I, and I find that the people who don't want to listen to the people that have walked this way before, that they don't, know how to, they don't know how to have conversations, they don't know how to treat them as brothers, they don't know how to treat them respectfully, and then they end up making the same mistakes <laughs> that they could have learned from had they listened to the generation before them. And that's not to say the generation before is always gonna be perfect, but we are called to regard those older in the faith as brothers and sisters and to do so with humility. Going on to verse four. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those, were long, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, happy Labor Day, everybody. Like, aren't we encouraged? Like, <laughs> isn't this a beautiful thing? Uh, you know, long beforehand condemned, marked out for this condemnation. Um, the grace of our God into licentiousness right? Have you ever heard the phrase like something along the lines of, oh, well, there's grace for that, right? Like, it's okay if I sin. Like, like it's going to be forgiven. Like, like, this is the type of disposition and this is the type of attitude that we need to be careful of. The other error, of course, is legalism where there's no grace for that, right? There's no forgiveness for that. But over here, what we're seeing is, and including by the examples that follow, is there is a very uh, licentious approach to being given free grace. And of course, we know it's not free, but. And he transitions into verse five to say, now I desire to remind you. Again, that's where it's very, very important to actually spend some time reading your Bible. I'm not trying to tell us that we all have to be Dave or me or Lyle or anyone else who comes up here and teaches, but to be familiar enough to say when someone reminds you that you're like, oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. That's, that's the goal. We're not trying to turn everybody into a preacher to stand up here, right? I get judged with greater strictness if you read elsewhere in scripture for being up here and teaching you. If I'm wrong on anything, right, and you listen to that and you follow that, like I experienced this as a software consultant. I'll say the software does something and I'll be kind of sure. <laughs> 
And then I'll go talk to a colleague. I'll be like, hey, hey, does it really do that? It's like, no, why did you say that? I'm like, okay, hold on. I got to go back and I got to correct what it is that I just said. Um, how much more so than with the word of God that, that people know? It's not enough to just say, oh yeah, you know, in Mark, like open it up, look at it, read it together and be familiar with it. So that way you can reference it. He goes on to say, you know all things once for all. So that means they were nuclear physicists, right? That's exactly what that's talking about. They could do, it's the same as, as rocket surgery, right? Uh, that's obviously not what he's talking about, not just because rockets weren't around back then. Uh, but what he means is all things that are important for the walk of your salvation. Again, if we're familiar enough with the gospel, if we understand our relationship with Christ, uh, we can be reminded of things, these things and to actually know all the important things that matter regardless of the trial or circumstance that we're in. He goes on to, and I'll read a big chunk here, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe, group one. And angels did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode. He has kept in eternal bonds until under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Group two. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Group three. Why these three different groups and what do they signify? Well, who is in group one being led out of Egypt? Jesus. Did you say Jesus? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I love you. I'm sorry. I thought you were, I thought you were poking fun. One of the bad things about sitting with my wife is we'll make fun of Dave sometimes when he's preaching. I probably shouldn't tell you that. <laughs> I, will, I will make fun of him and she will laugh. That's what I do. I'll say things like that. No, the Jews, right. The Jews. Thank you, love. Thank you. The Jews, group one, the Jews. Who's in group two? In group, in verse six. Angels, there we go. Angels are in group two. Who's in groups, who's in group three? Yeah, the Gentiles. All three groups. God shows no partiality. Isn't, isn't, isn't that humbling to realize that these are not just examples of judgment, these are examples of judgment against pretty much all of creation? Even God's own chosen people, they, they refuse to believe. He's like, okay, like I gave you a chance. I had miracles, I led you out. I showed you the promised land, you're done. Angels, angels had a one and done, right? Like they followed Satan, no opportunity for forgiveness there. And then even Sodom and Gomorrah and all of their passion and all of their, and, and I, I hate to say it, I know where we live in the era that we live, but it is important to point out that gross immorality and strange flesh attribute the sexual sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. You, you, can, you can gussy it up and you can play it up all you want, but I believe it's very, very important that Sodom and Gomorrah are used here as an example, especially as you see churches out there that are more than willing to compromise on these things. In some ways, this letter needs to be read there and because it is addressed to them. But all three people groups, all three people groups, <sighs> very sobering and very humbling. Yet in the same, don't worry, it gets better. We have, we have other stuff to look forward to. It's gonna get a little rough still and then it's gonna get better. Yet in the same way, these men also by dreaming, this dreaming concept has to do with prophesying by way of, of dreaming, I believe. So they, they, would, they would show up and say, I had a dream, I had a vision, and they would go ahead and share this. Uh, you see this concept elsewhere in scripture. Defile the flesh. So the very act of doing this makes them unclean, impure, and reject authority, and revile angelic majesties. So while there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one here between the three examples and then the three um, things that are, that are in consequence, notice that Jude loves working with threes. So there's this sense, remember, whenever something is in triplicate, it's a perfect, it's in the perfect sense. Then it gets weird. <laughs> But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Well, I'm so glad that's clear. <laughs> I'm so glad that's easy to understand. Um, talking with Randy. Randy, what was the book again? The, the, Ascension of Moses. 
the ascension of Moses, which uh, we do not consider as scripture, but it is a, I think it's Jewish apocrypha, as I recall, uh, talks about this specifically. Later on as well, if jumping ahead in verse, uh, when it talks about Enoch in verse 14, here we have the book of Jude referencing things that would have been familiar to the culture but are not explicitly found in scripture. And this can be very, very tricky. This can be difficult. This is some of the stuff that people will say, well, well, the Bible's inconsistent, and I'm just gonna go ahead and walk away from this because you can't even keep your own sources straight. Um, it's one of those things where just because something is quoted elsewhere doesn't mean that it's true. And the fact that it is brought into scripture, right? What we believe is scripture <laughs> demonstrates its truthfulness, but that doesn't automatically associate everything else that is written as true. If you read the Ascension of Moses and if you read the book of Enoch, which not expecting you to, um, to be honest, I didn't, but not in full, but as you read these things, you understand why they are not necessarily included in scripture. Um, that's not necessarily where I'm like, read your Bible, read your Bible. Oh, and also read Apocrypha, read Jewish, <laughs> read Jewish literature. We'll just stick with the Bible for right now. So even if you didn't know that it was in the ascension of Moses and you're just like, okay, I was tracking with you up until verse nine and then you lost me, right? We're going to find things in scripture that we don't understand. So how do we at least take the things that we do know to get an understanding? So we know who Michael is, Michael the archangel. Uh, he and Satan, the, the devil, would have at some point in time, uh, likely the, the closest, most uh, colloquial illustration I can think of is they would have been colleagues at one point in time. Same echelon, same hierarchy in terms of being right up there uh, in, the, in the angel hierarchy. So when Michael, obviously, what do we know about Michael? Well, he's on God's side. Devil, rebelled against God, thought he could do better, full of pride and sin, argued about the body of Moses, had no idea this happened. <laughs> you can't find it in, Gen in any of the Pentateuch. You don't see it in the scripture, but apparently this was a thing. Um, they argued about it, and Michael did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, we know that Michael, as the archangel, would have been in charge of the armies of the Lord. So he has power. He has favor. He has, in some ways, given authority. And with all of that behind him, looking at someone who has fallen and never return, he said, the Lord rebuke you. This is very, very, I think this is a, a, a wonderful precedent that Jude is coming up here because it can be very, very easy when we discover falsehood or lies to kind of rush in and say, well, you're not a Christian and that's not true and you've been living a lie this entire time, right? Because, because that's what falsehood does is we want to just, just, just weed it out. But Michael understood who he was and who God was. Remember earlier, Jesus said he saw Satan cast out of heaven like a flash of lightning. God is not without power here. <laughs> the, this is where I think it's important to realize that God can take care of himself. <laughs> So Michael did not presume that it was his place to condemn Satan in this argument. We don't take the salvation of other believers into our hands. We can question their walk, we can talk about their sin, we can understand where they're coming from, but ultimately salvation belongs to and is from God. And so when we're talking about serious theological error, it can be very, very glib and very, very easy to rush in and say, well, you're a sinner, you're not saved, that's not true, now I'm doubting everything that you've ever done. As we find out later on, just foreshadow, the, the instructions are to have mercy on such. Doesn't, doesn't that just, if, if, if you say these things against someone who is actually a believer and they're just in serious theological error, what do you think their walk looks like if you just rail against them, if you just push hard against them? and say, well, nothing that you stand for is therefore true. You, you are now responsible for crippling their walk. It's very, very, very important to understand when dealing with falsehood within the body, wherever that may be, again, not explicitly pointing to new creation, but wherever we encounter that, to have a large dose of humility and mercy and recognize that the Lord is able to rebuke, like hard rebuke those who have truly and intentionally rebelled against him. Verse 10, 
But these men revile the things which they do not understand. So d the devil actually understood what he was fighting about. <laughs> That's how I understand that. The devil's like, oh yeah, I know about Moses. I just want to fight you. <laughs> These guys revile the things that they don't get, that they don't understand, and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. So their very instincts are the things that are actually proving that they are not of God. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. So to jump on back here for Cain... I'll just go ahead and read it real quick. Uh, uh -huh. So in Genesis verse four, starting around in uh, verse three, so it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel on his part also brought of the first firstlings of his flock and of their fat portion. And the, or, and the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. And what happened? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain told Abel his brother and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. And again, as Dave has pointed out, the indignance in verse nine. Uh, then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Meaning he, you, he was your responsibility. Why didn't you save him? <laughs> Switching again to Balaam, which of course there's a joke to be had there that if God can speak out of a donkey, then he can use any one of us. <laughs> See, but, but you know the scripture reference, right? I can make a joke like that and, and you chuckle because you know the scripture well enough to understand what I'm talking about. And that's exactly what's going on in Jude. So thank you. I've never actually been more happy to have someone laugh at my joke <laughs> Be because it has true biblical evidence and ramifications for it. It's brilliant. It's beautiful. Um, going down here. Behold, these caused the sun, and I'm in, sorry, Numbers 31, 16. I'm not just making this up. Behold, these caused the sons of Israel through the council of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. So the plague was among the congregation of the Lord. We see here that Balaam actually brought temptation for them to sin. And likewise, Korah, stepping back just a little bit, in Numbers 16, starting in one through three. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Ab Abiram, the, the sons of Eliab, and on the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben took action. And they rose up before Moses together with some of the sons of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, leaders, chosen in the assembly, men of renown. They assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have gone far enough for all the congregation are holy, every one of them and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? And then continuing on in 31. So we see here that uh, reading before that, Moses speaks to these men actually beginning in 28. By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these deeds, for this is not my doing. If these men die the death of all men, or if they suffer the fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord brings about an entirely new thing and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that is theirs and they descend alive into Sheol, then you will understand that these men have spurned the Lord. As he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up and their households and all the men who belonged to Korah with their possessions. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive to Sheol and the earth closed over them and they perished from the midst of the assembly. Notice that it was specifically the men who spurned, the men who rebelled. It wasn't this accidental thing and a handful of innocents also fell in. So when he says woe to them, he's citing three very specific examples. We have Cain, we have Balaam, and we have Korah, who decided that they knew better. Verse 12, these are the men who are hidden reefs. What? What's a hidden reef? <laughs> what does that matter? <laughs> 
So as much as I could understand, I did spend a little bit of time trying to research this. A hidden reef would be something like rocks as you are navigating treacherous waters. So these would have been things that you would not necessarily have seen, but as you're navigating your boat, they could absolutely destroy your voyage and, and shipwreck you. So these are the men who are hidden feasts, hidden reefs in your love feasts when they feast with you without fear. I believe that the love feasts are talking about how believers used to gather and have meals together and then partake in, in the Lord's Supper right after that. So these are people who, had, who were part of the community. They would show up. They would uh, partake in a meal with everyone and even take the Lord's Supper. But they do this without fear. They have no regard, no reverence. I was talking with my wife about this yesterday. Like it's almost, it's almost better to try and disprove God. No, I was talking about it with Nikolai yesterday. It's almost better to try and disprove God. It's almost better to be so angry at God and, and hate him so much that you're gonna just search through the scriptures and try and find a way to disprove them rather than to be so apathetic that you have no fear for what you're doing. These are individuals who, who have no problem as he goes on, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted. You ever, in northern Nevada, I'm sure you have, you see all these nice big thick clouds coming over the mountain, and you're like, oh, come on, please rain, and sometimes they just keep going, and they wave as they're going by. <laughs> and it's like, but we need you, come back. <laughs> That's the imagery here. I mean, we, we can take a look at this imagery. We know exactly what this means, like big, thick rain clouds, and, and they provide nothing for us. These men are like that. They're only concerned with themselves. These people that are the falsehoods within this congregation. Wild waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. No... Uh, Obviously, stars referring to angels, black darkness. If you go back again to, uh, where was it? It was in verse six. He has kept these angels in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day, right? So literally, they're, follow, they're following fallen spirits, fallen demons, fallen angels. Fallen angels are demons. It was about these men that Enoch, verse 14, in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, behold, <laughs> The Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, what's actually kind of interesting is this literally word for word copies um, the book of Enoch, which again we mentioned before. So if you try to look at footnotes for this section, it's gonna take you to a whole bunch of other different places because you find these things in scripture, right? And then out of that came the book of Enoch. And the book of Enoch happened to get this thing extremely explicitly right. And because Enoch was familiar to the people that Jude was writing to at the time, he went ahead and just plucked it in and said, look at this. You've seen this as well with Paul. Paul will quote poets and authors of the day uh, in order to prove a point. Um, in, in, in a very glib sense, perhaps it's glib, but anything that is actually true, like eternally true and ultimately true that we can find in here comes from God. It's still God's truth. That doesn't mean, again, the rest of the book of Enoch we can listen to and we can adhere to and we need to incorporate it into scripture and kind of jam it in there. That's not what I'm saying. But like if we, even every once in a while, like when you see a movie and, you're, and it just somehow, it's not even a Christian movie, but it stirs you in a way that causes you to worship God. Like every once in a while, you know, good things come out of unexpected places. That's not to say that we worship those things. It's not to say that we incorporate those things. Those things still are those things. But if they, they draw us to worship God and they can be found in scripture, we should go ahead and take them, of course, with caution. He goes on in 16 to conclude his description of these individuals. These are grumblers. That's not to say if you've ever grumbled that this applies to you. Relax. Again, context. But look at the fullness of this description. Grumblers, finding fault, following after their own lust. This is not necessarily sexual lust, although definitely we have a flavor of sexual lust based on the inclusion of Sodom and Gomorrah earlier. This is any passion that's contrary to God. This, this is greed, this is sloth, this is, uh, what? Idols. Idols, any type of idolatry, thank you. 
Uh, this is anything at all where you are so dead set passionate about it um, that you forsake the grace of God. They speak arrogantly, arrogantly, right? Flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. So look at the fullness of this description. I think it's again very tempting. I, I've noticed this at least, that because one person used a particular word that therefore that means all of these other different things and then we need to follow all of those different things because that one word was mentioned. And we can apply it internally as well. Oh no, I'm a grumbler. I grumble all the time. If I ever grumble again, that means I'm a false teacher. And, so, <laughs> and we should chuckle at that a little bit, right? We should, but, but, but sometimes Sometimes aren't these the things that we carry? Oh no, no, I, I was angry again about this thing that I know doesn't matter, but it irritated me. Um, look at the fullness of the description. He doesn't say these are grumblers. Hmm? Yeah, what's he gonna do about that? Anybody who grumbles, need to go. That's, that's not what he's talking about. We need to stop, I think, focusing so much on the things that come out of us and like Dave has talked about, take all of those thoughts captive to obey Christ. So a thought, as mentioned in 1 Corinthians, is not just an isolated thing, but it's a system of belief. It's a system of truth. So, okay, fine, you grumbled. You take that thought captive to Christ. That's the tip of the iceberg. What's beneath that? Why do you grumble? What is it about the grumbling that causes you to go there in the first place? Well, I'm irritated. Well, I'm tired. Well, I'm sleepy, right? It's not because I hate God. I can't believe he's doing this. Like, I can tell you in my pre-Christ days that I was a grumbler, as I understand this word. I knew God was real. I hated his guts. He was a cosmic killjoy. Um... <laughs> And, and I was out to prove him that I knew better. Like that was pre-Christ Mark. I was very grumpy, very bitter. Um, like it's hard to imagine for those of you that have known me for a little while, <laughs> but that's the beautiful testimony of the grace of God is he can take someone that grumbles, give them some mercy and some hope, give them the life of Christ and they're totally transformed totally transformed. So, so we need to kind of be careful of these words. Just because we think we understand these words doesn't mean what you think it means. So that was all very, very depressing and, and discouraging. Um, one of the, <laughs> real quick, I'm not, before we go into 17, which actually is the hardcore application, right? Because he begins with, but you beloved. Uh, I'm gonna go back to 2 Peter chapter two. One of the things that I read in the commentaries that I was reading is that Jude was written as an after and 2 Peter chapter two was written as a before. And I'm just gonna take a little bit of time to go through the whole chapter and a little bit of chapter three just to kind of explain what was happening. And listen, listen to the familiarities. It's so crazy. So this one was written by Peter. Uh, the other one was written by Jude. And, and listen to how many things that you've heard already before in the last hour. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you. Okay, so that's the pre part. Who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter... And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, parentheses, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. Daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties, whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like unreasoning animals born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed. Suffering wrong as the wages of their doing wrong, they count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you. 
having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he received a rebuke for his own transgression, for a mute donkey speaking with the voice of a man restrained the madness of the prophet. These are springs without water and mist driven by a storm for whom the black darkness has been reserved. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them to not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. Chapter three. This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Do you hear the overlap? Sodom and Gomorrah, following their own lusts, the difference is that was written as a warning. This is written as something after it has happened. And so it can be tempting, I think, to look back and be grossly um, discouraged by the fact that Jude so frequently quotes or at least references the same imagery of Second Peter. But if we look at this as a reminder, I think it can provide a strange comfort. Like you knew this was going to happen, here it is. This is their ways, this is what they're all about. Like you're being reminded of the fact that this was going to come and it has come and it's still true, it's still the same. We told you beforehand, it's still the same now. So nothing has really changed. There is comfort in constancy. There is comfort in familiarity. There is comfort in being able to be reminded of something even in the, even in the middle of anticipated trials. And we know that as well by looking at verse 17. But you, beloved, ought to remember that we're spoken, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles. We just read that in Jude, in, in Second Peter. Remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they were saying to you, in the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lust. Like if you have a Bible with footnotes, Second Peter and Jude are like all over the place in terms of cross references. It's like this, this spider web to get sucked into. Uh, so again, remember, this was going to happen. It should not be a surprise. We were warning you, here it is, and there's hope. In 19, these are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the spirit. 20, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, but you, beloved, again, we just got done talking about condemnation, all people groups, no one is exempt, God shows no favor, God shows no partiality, except, of course, to you, beloved. You have put your faith in, in Christ. You are saved. You are forgiven. You are a new creation. That's literally why we called this church new creation. Well, not me. I wasn't there for that. But that's why this church is called. <laughs> that's why this church is called new creation, because you have been made new. And if that even tinges at you a little bit, but you, beloved, I want to encourage you to kind of relax. It's okay. Again, the worst place to be is a place of apathy even if it kind of incenses you a little bit and, and incites you to be like, I mean, let's talk about that. It's, I can work with someone who, who has something to say, someone who's apathetic and is indifferent. How do, you, how, do you, how do you hook into that? How do you work with that? But you, beloved, genuinely, truly, do you believe that? Like that there is actually a perfect heavenly father uh, that genuinely knows your name and everything about you because he made you and he has... Uh, a life in Christ for you, not necessarily one that's free of pain or trial or difficulty, but a, an eternal life that when we are done with here, it will be as perfect and pristine as, as any of us can imagine and more. 
building yourselves up on your most holy faith, right? So this is where I had a hard, because like I actually really kind of enjoy fire and brimstone. I actually, I was like, yes, we could talk about judgment. I have missed talking about judgment. No one in the, <laughs> no one in culture wants to talk about judgment of sin anymore. Sin is a four letter word. And I'm like, but it's got real eternal consequences and promises associated with it. And so I was really kind of happy to talk about that part because it serves as warnings. It serves as, as kind of like that, that prod when we're like, no, I don't want to follow God. Okay, well, there's judgment. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe I was wrong there. Um, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. We have to be built up. It can't just be judgment. It can't just be judgment. It can't just be com- condemnation. It can't just be rules. It can't just be grace turned into licentiousness either, right? We have to be built up in our holy faith. Again, going back to verse three, where it says, contend earnestly for the faith. If, you're not, if we do not contend for the faith here in, in, as a body of Christ, where else will it be contended for? When we gather, if we are not contending for truth, if we're not contending for scripture, if we're not advocating for prayer, if we are not actively trying to talk about the eternal things that matter, then where else in this, pardon the phrasing, literal God-forsaken world (laughs) is it going to happen? When we gather, we contend for the faith because we need to hear it, because we can be led astray, because we can fall prey to things that are maybe mostly true and then kind of twisted. Sound familiar, Adam and Eve? Praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I actually, I, I, I love to pray. I, I, I think, you know, like, I know Jesus is my homeboy was a thing, but I literally believe that Jesus is my best friend because he hears all of my prayers. <laughs> he hears all of them, from the most eloquent and erudite to the like, I messed up really bad. <laughs> Like, I shouldn't even have to, I shouldn't even be coming to you with this. And it can be intimidating to pray. I know on our Wednesday thing, sometimes it's like, well, I don't, I don't want to pray for that. I don't know how to pray for that. It can be intimidating to pray in public, uh, which is fine. You know, definitely go ahead and pray at home. But one of the things that ought to be the greatest encouragement, which we haven't got to yet in Romans, in chapter 8, uh, verse 26, is... Um, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should. We don't. I mean, I, half the time I'm just like, I want to talk about that, and I open my mouth, and the next thing I know, I'm done, and I've prayed. Like, I didn't plan that. I didn't write it out. I didn't open my prayer journal and be like, like this is a good one, right? <laughs> This is one that everybody needs to hear because I worked hard on this prayer. <laughs> um, sometimes if we take things the other way, we, we kind of see how, how ridiculous some of our fears can be sometimes. Not to, not to shame anybody, but like sometimes I, 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 like, I'm not, when we pray, we're not praying. We are praying in the presence of one another, but we're talking to God. It's almost like we're talking through each other, right? Like I'm not, I'm not praying at the back of the wall. I'm not praying to the people who are right in front of me. It's like even farther than that. Like I'm talking to the big man. I'm talking to my God and my savior, Jesus. And I don't know what to say. I mean, he's Lord, he's God. But we find that the spirit helps us. He who searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I used to lead a, a, a regular Sunday prayer ministry and people would come in. They're like, I want to pray. I don't know how to pray. What should I do? And I'm like, well, as long as you're not saying, thank you, Lord God, for the sin that I've just committed, I think you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, thank, thank you, God, for the fact that you give me all this grace and I can just go ahead and do whatever I want and sin everywhere and hurt people. You know, like, that's not a prayer, right? Like, like, sometimes we have to take things the other way to the extreme to realize that, like, the things that we're worried about are kind of small. They're not bad. It's not, not to invalidate fears, right? Because we have to address them. But it's kind of silly when you think about it that way, isn't it? Like, oh, well, I'm not going to pray that. Okay, well, then what do you want to pray? <laughs> Keep yourselves in the love of God, verse 21, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. There's that word mercy again, right? Going back to, it was brought up in in verse two, mercy. This is the application chunk from 17 through to um, 23. So you're in this situation, you don't know what to do. I mean, what did Michael the archangel do? I'm not an archangel. 
Michael said, the Lord rebuke you to Satan. <laughs> so what do we do when we're in the presence of people and we're really not sure where we're coming from? Well, it doesn't say forsake truth. It doesn't say go along with whatever they're saying, pretend like it's okay and talk about them behind their back. It has, it has mercy. And again, I was talking with a friend of mine. It's like, it's never a bad default to have mercy on someone. It's never a bad default to be like, like, help me understand what you're talking about. I don't think that means what you think it means. Like, let's talk this through, you know, rather than like, you're a heretic. And I mean, I'm, I'm kind of being exaggerative about that, but in the online world, people are very cut and dry, very mean, very have nothing to do with it. And we don't know how to interact with each other anymore. And so when you're in the physical presence of someone who's spouting off things as though they are true and they are really not, the application, as maybe obtuse or as difficult as it is, is to have mercy. This person does not know what they're talking about. We do not know the eternal state of this person's soul. We do not know what God has in store for them. You could be the thing in your loving kindness, in your graciousness upon them that corrects a horrible, horrible evil, a terrible lie. You know, you can say things that are true and, and, and if, if you, you don't have love behind it, no one's gonna listen. Right? Jesus loves you. I mean, that's true, semantically, if you pull the tone out of it. <laughs> Those words are right. <laughs> Have mercy on some who are doubting. When we find ourselves, especially in this world, especially in this information overload culture, we hear a variety of different opinions and we hear a variety of different things. And again, the application, have mercy on those who are doubting, literally those who are of two minds. If you have mercy on someone who is struggling between two different schools of thought, the one that is actually of God will receive mercy, right? The one, if you show mercy to someone and they don't accept that mercy, what does that say of them? They don't really need mercy. They don't care about mercy. They want to be right. They want to be moral. They want to be this. They want to be that. But for those who are in Christ and you're like, I'm really just trying to understand what what Jesus is all about and what God is all about, and you come at them from a disposition of, well, let me help you with that. Mercy will strengthen the things that are true. Mercy will strengthen the things that are good. Mercy will strengthen the things that are faithful and righteous and eternal. Mercy will suss out the evil and prove, put to shame, the things that are not of God. And then verse 23, save others, snatching them out of the fire. Uh, and on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Once again, another very clear verse uh, <laughs> to go ahead and apply. Again, we're going to encounter things we don't understand, not just in the Bible. We encounter things we don't understand out in the real world. I mean, if we were to disavow everything that we did not fully and perfectly understand, you'd all be walking home. Because we drove cars. <laughs> Uh, cars have many explosions inside of them. I don't know how that works. Why does that work that way? It's bizarre. Thank you for the chuckle. <laughs> but what can we suss out of this? One, it's okay to not know everything. I know Dave is like a master of scripture because he's been doing this for decades. Um, and I, I love the word of God, but I look at this and I'm like, I, I, I don't know. And I found some commentary stuff, but I think the important thing for all of us is like, it's okay not to know. Well, again, what can we learn from this? Save others, snatching them out of the fire. Is that the metaphor for fire as condemnation? I mean, maybe, but again, it, keeping with the theme, we know it, it, what it means to save others. It's to share the gospel with them. It's to bring them back to the core, make the main thing the main thing. Reinforce the truth of the gospel of Christ. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Don't know what that means, but we do understand the word mercy and we do understand the word fear. There are some people we can still show mercy to, but kind of be afraid of being influenced by what they're talking about. A few more minutes, I promise. I really am like Dave, I'm going over time. Verse 24, now to him who is able to keep you, this has got to be the most comforting thing in the whole thing whole thing. Him who is able to keep you, you are saved and there is nothing you can do about it. Jesus is able to bring you back. I can't, I mean, I could, but we're out of time. All the dumb things that I have believed over my two decades in walking as a Christian. If you want a list, come talk to me afterwards. But, but God in his mercy and God in his correction and by reading his word and by prayer and by seeing the fruitlessness of some of those things, like he is able to keep me. 
it's again, one of the great values of walking with some, of, of learning from someone who's been walking the faith for generations, for decades. Like, oh man, I used to, I was so dumb. Let me tell you what worked for me. And keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless, without sin, without flaw, without fault, with great joy. I have to believe that is our joy, but I also think it's God's joy. God rejoices in his handiwork in our lives. He will rejoice over you with, with, with um, shouts and glad singing, I want to say, Zephaniah 317, thereabouts. And then lastly, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. God is timeless. He is apart from time. If anybody can save, if anyone can rescue, if anyone can clear out the mess of unbelief and preserve a congregation and continue to keep them despite lies and falsehood, God outside of time can. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm deeply grateful for your word and the ability to teach and and preach today. Um, Honestly, thank uh, thank you for trials and thank you for difficulties because they teach us to trust you. I even thank you for confusing pieces of text because these are the things that we can talk about and grow in our learning and our understanding of you. Um, You are God, and so sometimes that means that you reserve some mysteries only for yourself, and that's okay. Uh, If if we knew everything about you, then you would cease to be God, so I'm kind of grateful for some of the things that are difficult. We thank you, Lord God, above all else, that you are able to keep us that you have shown great, deep mercy in us and continue to do so as you lead us, as you teach us, as you bring us in contact with your word, as you continue to build us up in faith. Give us the strength and encouragement to pray in the Holy Spirit, not for men, not for the praise and adoration of those around us, but because we really believe that we can come before your throne room and talk to you about our lives, about our struggles, about our victories, about our joys, about the things that confuse and confound us that we have a deep, eternal, abiding relationship with you, Father, because of Jesus Christ. And that gives us access to your throne. It gives us mercy. It gives us the ability to show mercy to others. And it is evident by the fact that you keep us. You are so good at being a good shepherd. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the people who are here. We love you and praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen.